thank you all for coming. And I'm very, very excited to be here talking about junk, which was uh, a very timely play, in my opinion. So I'd like to start by just reading a quote of Ayad's from that great piece about him that was on the front of the arts and leisure section of the Times a couple of weeks ago, where he said, the whole culture around rights, it's valuable and it's important, but it's not really what's happening. Identity politics on both sides have, has the nation consumed and distracted from the real story. Money is what's happening. So as a journalist who covers uh, the intersection of sort of finance and the real world, I completely agree. And um, you know, I think this, this play is extremely timely because it really does help shed light on the ways that high finance are actually influencing everything going on in ways that we don't always see. So I wanted to start by asking Ayad, first of all, if you could describe the world mm -hmm. uh, of this play and also how you became interested in this world. So, so uh, thanks, Sheila, and uh, thanks for coming, guys. Uh, the play is set in the uh, in the mid '80s, and you know, uh, Doug and I uh, w felt pretty strongly that uh, the uh, insistence on period was not uh, something that that we should focus too much on because you know things haven't really changed. I mean, it it, it would be one thing to sort of. Uh, you know, send up, uh, you know, high finance in the 80s and sort of say, oh, God, you know, back then, look at what they were doing and all of that. Well, the things that was felt egregious or new or confusing or disorienting or disruptive or remarkable or very lucrative at that time are just de rigueur now. They're just the way every every business is run. You know, I mean, just a really simple, small example in the, in the 70s, 2% market share was justifiable uh, antitrust regulation situation. You know, now 60% market share doesn't even represent, a, you know, a, a, a monopoly. So, you know, times have changed so much that the beginning of this movement to monetize and finance everything uh, to treat uh, money like, uh, basically, you know, to leverage 30 to 1, 40 to 1, whatever it is, all that stuff, that's now become the way that we live. And so we, we wanted to tell a story about how that kind of came into being, if you will, even though this isn't necessarily the only story of how it came into being. But I wanted to tell an entertaining, vivid, moving story about it, so. So, so when, you, when you meet someone on the street and you try and explain what risk arbitrage is, which is something I used to do before journalism, often their, their eyes kind of glaze over and it's really hard to explain it to people who don't follow this. So I wanted to just ask, how did you, um, how did you learn about this? How do you even know what a junk bond, which is also called a high yield bond, uh, <laughs> just to impress everyone with my knowledge, um, how did you even learn what that was? My, my dad, and when I moved to New York in my early 20s, my dad made a deal with me. He said, if you read the Wall Street Journal every day, I'll pay your rent. Mm -hmm. So I was. Oh, <laughs> sweet deal that yeah. I would have taken. He, yeah. He's a very smart guy. He knew I liked to read. And he and my mom were trying to figure out, you know, this kid is reading this poetry all the time. What is this? Mm -hmm. How is he going <laughs> to, where is the kid going to make some money? I, you know. Two so, doctors, am I right? Two, yep. Both doctors. Yep. But my dad always is, uh, sort of like styled himself as a kind of like entrepreneur, self-made businessman and built a cardiology group into the largest cardiology group in Wisconsin. And so, you know, he was really a, an avid reader of the business page and I think tried to get me interested in, and, and you know, and I've said this in the past that I, that happened at a time, it was the mid 90s when the bull market, that first, you know, tech bull market was happening, just started and, you know, Tina Brown had recently taken over The New Yorker, and profiles of Allen & Co. sat cheek by jowl with profiles of Mikhail Brishnikov. And so everyone in the culture, even at the, in the culture circles, was talking about money. So that's how I got interested in it, and I've been uh, you know, interested in it ever since. And you know, in writing this play, you know, which is something that Doug and I have been involved, been involved together now for three years on it, and you know, Doug is a really, really smart guy. So if, if Doug asks a question about like, okay, well, what exactly does this thing mean? Let's figure out a way to, you know, dramatize it in a simple My way. ignorance <laughs> has been incredibly useful <laughs> to uh, No, but I mean, he would, he'd, he'd sort of point to areas of the play that, 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 you know, perhaps I understood or perhaps he understood, but that, you know, might be more challenging. So there's been a long process of distilling and combing and finding simpler ways, you know, uh, leverage buyout, 
you know, we have the opening scene, uh, Bob Merkin, who uh, is the junk bond financier, he, he raises money by promising huge returns to his investors, uh, uh, yearly returns on a bond, on a junk bond, 17, 20%, and uh, then gives that money to somebody to go buy a company. And, uh, you know, completes the financing often by raising money against the collateral of a, you know, maybe raising collateral, using a company's cash flow as collateral that he will then use that, he'll take that loan from a bank and use the rest to buy the company. So that's the way we, t it's a very simple way that it's dramatized. I did a poor job of explaining it now, but this play does a, a simpler job of sort of explaining it. We'll see in a scene here. Uh, Everson Steel uh, is the company that Bob Merkin and his guys are going to take over. So for the first time they're playing, making a play on the Dow Jones. So yeah, so it's it's just a, it's a dramatic pro it's a process of sort of going back and forth with Doug and then you know working with actors and you know a lot of times their um, their loving questions are are, are useful uh, to clarify. You know, so that's uh, yeah. But uh, if I may too, I think I think that the yes, there is the technical mastery or the, the uh, financial jargon that has to be understood. But the tale of junk is really a tale of uh, the kind of magic of money, the emotion behind uh, money, the combat uh, behind uh, money. That all of the graphs and charts and uh, flows and upticks and downticks really are a kind of notation for emotional life, and that's what that's dramatists do. I mean, I, when I read a draft of the play, it was just about three years ago, Ed and I had breakfast. I, I often say, you know, Holden Caulfield and The Catcher in the Rye says, you know, I had to read a book, I really like to, I, wouldn't it be great if I could just call up the author and uh, meet with him? And I read a play of Ed's and I called him up. and. Um, and I, and, and I had the feeling, I, I was like, oh, wow, Doug Hughes is calling. I must have made it. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> but there was a, there, there, in front of, you know, I asked him what he was working on. And it was a play about, it wasn't finished, and it was very different. But it was a play about something that troubled my sleep. And I think that's what dramatists do. They write about the things that trouble our sleep and bring them on stage. And perhaps not knowing it, uh, I realized that I felt as though I was living in a world where the market had been deified. And there was no other civilization except the financial civilization. That's a good thing to write a play about. And so how did the play come into your hands in the first place? Did someone think that you would be... I think A. Ed handed it to me. <laughs> <laughs> he slipped uh, it under your door. Well, well, the thing was, I had finished yeah. a draft of this play, and I was very excited. It was a very big play. You know, I, I, I had had the, the astonishing and shocking and bewildering and, and still, at times, hard to believe good fortune of winning the Pulitzer. And I knew that there was a window that if I wrote something totally insane and very <laughs> difficult to do, that, that maybe now, and this, I have this little window, that it would actually get done. And so I had been wanting to write a big play about finance for a long time, so I just sat down and I started to do it. And I, you know, eventually wrote this draft of a play. It was 48 scenes and 17 characters and three acts and very, very big. Very expensive to do. And Doug at that time called me. As I said, I felt like, you know, I, I, I had wanted Doug to direct Disgraced, and he passed. I and was busy. <laughs> it's very different. <laughs> Have you forgiven him? For that? <laughs> yes. No. No. Terrible, I, I had no expect. Thing. I had no expectation that he would. I just, you know, he's Doug Hughes. You know. So, and uh, then, and then, I had written another play called The Invisible Hand, which I had also. I, I showed you a picture. I had a. I I'd written a po yeah. on a post-it in. But 2000, you didn't send me that one. On two thousand two thousand eleven, I wrote on a post-it, "Invisible Hand," directed by Doug Hughes, and put it up on my, <laughs> oh. on my desk. So, so eventually, I got to work with Doug. But, but so when we had breakfast, I. We were just talking, and I was, you know, I knew I wanted to share this play with him. It was just a kind of serendipity, and uh, he read it, and uh, he liked it. So that was that was great. And that that is, you know, it's very very unusual. I mean, when we go into previews uh, on the fifth of October, there that's twenty three people will be on the stage, and that we're living kind of in an era. I mean, they're marvelous plays being 
uh, written in America right now. But it's very rare you get a crack at a play of that uh, sweep. And um, yeah, Ayad really was attempting to write a, a history play, or as I often like to say, a war play about finance. And so I'd love to know from both of you what, uh, what you read, what you watched, consumed. Uh, we spoke briefly about Trading Places, which is this amazing movie <laughs> with Eddie Murphy about commodities Great movie. trading. <laughs> so one of my favorite movies, but, um, and also Orange Working Juice Girl. Orange Juice Futures. Yes, Orange Juice <laughs> Futures, it's so great. But okay. what, what did you, I mean, because it's, I'm always intrigued by people who are able to translate this world into kind of cultural products, it's not easy. Um, so well, there was a long process of sort of, of you know, I had read an article about uh, the CEO of VW committing, no, not the CEO, uh, a, a major investor in VW committing suicide when a takeover by Porsche went awry. And that sort of gave me this spark, this was a few years back, of, okay, the human stakes of a takeover battle. You know, and I was deeply impressed as a child, as a sort of late adolescent by Wall Street, in you know that, that the movie with uh, with Charlie Sheen and uh, and and Michael Douglas. So I think that that was always kind of a template too, in a way, um, to have a charismatic figure at the center of a very large story about a takeover. Um, and then I, you know, the, the in getting into the weeds on mergers and acquisitions and the way that that takeovers were financed, I suddenly realized, oh, right, debt. That's what made it possible. You know, there was never, there was never this kind of appetite or like debt was never an acceptable thing in the way that it became in the 80s. That was the shift. And somehow, you know, Doug has, has, has commented on this very eloquently. He says, you know, debt allowed money to be the thing, that, the only thing to be of, of value. You know, this paradoxically, it's like this thing that's not money, that is money, of course, because that's what debt is. But this thing that isn't real money is the thing that transforms all value into money. And so anyway, that's a very abstract philosophical concept, but it felt very pregnant. And so I started looking into, you know, junk bond financing and high yield debt financing and leverage buyouts and hostile takeovers. And of course, the saga of Marty Lipton and Michael Milken and Bruce Wasserstein and Ronald Perelman and Nelson Pels and all those guys, those kind of gargantuan figures and characters and personages. Now, if you're in business school, you read these books, you know, uh, you know, Barbarians at the Gate and Predator's Ball. And, and uh, so, yeah, so I, I immersed myself in that history and then the play emerged out of, out of a, con out of a you know, really an immersion in that history, that mythic American era. So did you make a reading list for Doug? And tell him that he yeah, should Yeah, there were a couple of titles. I mean, I had never read, I mean, I'm sure many in the audience know that uh, Den of Thieves is an incredibly compelling uh, book about Michael Bilkin and Drexel Burnham, and so is uh, The Predator's Ball uh, by uh, Connie Brook. And then there'd be uh, books that I would send uh, Ayad's way, you know, a book that I think did, we can safely say, had, you know, a, a furnished some inspiration for the plays by your colleague at The New Yorker, George Packer, The Unwinding. I think that, in many ways, was the play. That was the, the book that cemented the real soul of the play in some, some sense. I, I find it one of the, the most extraordinary books I've, I've read in, in a decade. And the, the great commitment to look at what was going on in Tampa, what was going on in Warren, Ohio, uh, what was happening in the mountains of uh, West Virginia as the world became financialized. I mean, and that's another thing that we spoke a great deal about is, I mean, in the opening scene of this play, we're not gonna see that scene tonight, but what are they talking about? They're really talking more about words and the power of words more than they are talking about numbers. That let's assign uh, various values to our experiment in finance. Let's make it about hope. Let's make it about ambition. And um, change, renewal. Yeah, change, renewal, reform. And these words have power. They become incantatory. That's why I, I have thought about the play really is the fact that there is a kind of spell being cast because we really are talking about pieces of paper. And in the paper, in the play, the guy who, the, the, the central financial uh, genius of the play is put on 
the cover of Time magazine and the tag Time magazine uses uh, when he lands on that cover is America's Alchemist from nothing something. Yeah, debt from nothing something. I guess it's worth mentioning that George Packer's book was very, uh, it was very effective at sort of showing what happens on the ground when all this financialization occurs and then everything blows up as it did in the financial crisis. He really did a good job of sort of charting the way people were just slipping out of the middle class, losing their homes. I mean, it was very moving. Yeah. So, so can you describe a little bit how you work together sort of on a daily basis, what the, what the back and forth was like? I write a scene, Doug reads it, tells me it's not any good, <laughs> and I should <laughs> write it again. <laughs> uh, no, you know, Doug, Doug has been, Doug has, uh, Doug has continually pushed me, and I think Doug recognizes my ambition to write uh, a play that can get its arms and its heart and its mind around our cultural moment in a, and I think he rec he is, he has the, the intellectual capacities to imagine that space and sort of lead me in that space. And so he has constantly prodded me and pushed me and, and uh, you know, at times has sort of compared the play to much greater plays and has uh, stoked my ambition to work <laughs> harder. Uh, and uh, so there's a lot of that. Was there a particular company you thought about? Uh, it's, it's really poignant watching, watching this um, fam steward of this family company suddenly sort of blindsided by these fancy financiers from New York and their debt and their tricks. And um, of course, you really see what, where this leads. This leads to jobs being lost and plants being closed and things being outsourced. So did you, what, did you just look in the newspaper? I mean, there are examples every day, but I there wonder are. if there was. And Toys yeah. R Us being the most recent. Yeah, yep, know, yep. Which just went, is, went to file for chapter 11 because of the, the debt that uh, Steve Roth and uh, Henry Kravitz and uh, uh, Bain Capital and Mitt Romney threw under the, the books in 2000. They're all here tonight. Yeah, right. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> so pointed, pointed <laughs> by a pointed criticism there. Um, you know, uh, we, it, it, the very first draft of this play, uh, I I'd composited the Revlon deal and the RJR Nabisco deal because those were the two most famous deals that I had come across from that time. And, you know, uh, neither industry felt like it was sufficiently stitched into the heart of the American experience. And so Doug and I had a long conversation one afternoon where, where we really brainstormed and tried to figure out, well, what would be the right uh, business? And I think we both landed on steel. So then I did a deep dive into the steel business. And uh, it turned out that this was a, this was a pivotal moment in, in steel and manufacturing in America. And so that became the central thrust of, of that part of the play. And so um, the, the kind of uh, M&A takeover, leverage buyout frenzy of the 80s, the, the milieu where Milken himself operated and he really helped usher this era of um, incredible borrowing, these new ways of companies to borrow money and expand and gobble up their competitors. It really changed the atmosphere in the US and it, it caused sort of terror in the hearts of CEOs of public companies. Um, I just wonder if you could characterize a bit what that that time was like. And, um, well, I think that's exactly yeah. right. I mean, I think, and, and they all had it out for him. Uh, you know, he was changing the rules, and uh, he was also bending the rules and maybe breaking a few laws. And uh, uh, but he was doing something incredibly uh, creative and incredibly new and incredibly uh, uh, disruptive. Um, and I think that generation, my, my, you know, my recollection, the research that I did, that generation, you know, I think American business needed a bit of a, an injection, or at least that's the ideology, that's the story that we now tell in retrospect, that that, that time was very good for American business, um, you know, so. And I, I think it's important hearing that to, to speak about the play, uh, that it is, it is not a polemic. It's very easy to say, well, okay, everything went wrong when uh, Michael Milken decided that uh, junk bonds uh, were, you know, could proliferate and create a lot of wealth. I, I think you know, somebody smart said um, uh, history really is the result of consequences, is the story of consequences that nobody ever really intended. There are uh, uh, Milken, uh, Milken's you know, experiment in the market had extraordinary results, but it's a kind of Prometheus story. 
I mean, incredible power is being played with, and there are uh, uh, consequences that are uh, thrilling for some and crushing for others. And, and I would say one more thing to that, which is that I think that uh, I think that Milken. Oh, wait, that just flew right out of my mind. It'll come well, back. I have. I, yeah, back. I was going to say one thing, which is, as, you know, some. I've, I've written a lot about insider trading, and I, I've looked a lot at Milken's case and Ivan Bosky, and then the more recent cases involving hedge fund traders and so on. And there is a big difference. I mean, the way the market evolved. Um, Milken, and you, you capture this really well in the play, actually, when they're trying to debate his, you know, your, your Merkin character, his legal strategy later. Um, he really did do something important that, you know, that, uh, you know, he, he made it possible for a lot of companies to grow. Yeah. And that, that just wasn't an option for them before. So a whole bunch of companies kind of entered the market and were able to expand, and they were able to hire people and build plants and do things that they perhaps would not have been able to do if they did not have access to credit because that, right. you know he did do that and then it could have got out of control and there was all this insider trading going on but a lot of what the, the financial activity now that's sort of comparable doesn't even involve that type of um, I don't know there's no creating of new markets or you know it's totally divorced from that function of helping companies to grow uh, it's just purely financial speculation yeah, it's purely derivative to use the yeah, I mean, I, f I still find it, I mean, naive as I am, that the term, I think we, we hear the term, the banking industry, the financial industry, which seems an entire misnomer to me because nothing's being created except wealth, which uh, it doesn't feel industrious in a way that, uh, you know, uh, creative uh, enterprises uh, should. So. Um could we speak about capitalism for a moment? So, so, um, so, so I've read some really interesting things you've said about this uh, elsewhere. Of course, we used to think of these kind of captains of industry as as great men, usually who um, went out and built railroads and manufactured things. And now uh, it's, it's we don't really make things anymore, and not, certainly not. We make apps, but we don't make you know. <laughs> right products that you can kind of hold. We, we, um, make, we make reasons to, uh, we make uh, contraptions to capture the attention of the populace. And then we monetize the attention. I mean, the, the system has become so uh, advanced in its ability to, uh, to uh, commodify and monetize that the simple act of consciousness is now generating income. So, you know, we are at a very late stage. It's a met metastatic in terms of its hold on uh, our consciousness. I mean, we can we can chuckle, but it's not it's not fun. It's so fun on Instagram. Yeah, it's sure. Great. And that's and, yeah. and it, it's the it's the it's the careful husbandry of our pleasure principle over two generations, and the scientific advances of understanding how to control economic choice that have allowed what I would call there's no better word or no other word for it the, co the corporate totalitarian regime to be able to take advantage and I'm not a, I'm not yeah. a communist yeah. I'm not you know the I'm first a thing, communist <laughs> first thing I are there first any thing, communists on the stage the yeah. first thing I say about it is that it's easy to criticize capitalism and even easier to enjoy its benefits and that's the contradiction that we're all caught in so it's not simple you can't just say but I don't think it serves anybody to sort of sit here and say, well, that's not what's going on. Sure, but it, it is what's going on. There are other things happening too. And again, I'll come back to the fact that, you know, a huge concern of ours is to implicate ourselves and to implicate everybody who comes to see uh, this play. I mean, it's hard, to, you know, not, I, I don't think my hands are clean. I have money in the stock market. I, uh, I get happy when the things tick up, and I get a little depressed when uh, things tick down. And uh, that's just a bit of liquid crystal fluctuating, and it has a lot of power yeah. uh, over me. Um, but I, I do think that the, you know, the, when we began work on this one day, we said, maybe this is a play about how they got our minds that these I ideas became, they're so attractive, they're so appealing, there is so much potential for relief from man's estate, never having to worry, having only the best, 
everything is taken care of. Your fear is banished from your life. Uh, that it just uh, kept growing and growing and growing. So, so um, debt was was sort of the gateway drug to this world. Yeah, it and was. Yeah. Right. John Guerre said a beautiful thing. He said, "What happened in the '80s? We no longer had a mandatory draft, and everybody got a credit card." Slippery no longer slope. a mandatory confrontation with death, but an, an, an embrace or sort of release into eternal bounty through credit. And I think that that is a fundamental psychic shift in the American experience. So, yeah. We're not a society of stoics anymore. So there is comedy in the play, by the way. Oh, it's case. very funny. It is just, very no, funny. No, no, I mean, yeah. it, it's, you know, it, it may <laughs> sound, we, we, <laughs> we huddle in Doug's office and, you know, plot our, our trenchant critiques, but, but they're, they're yeah. married to, they're married to but a desire all, to give... But we also punch up the laughs. Yeah. We really do. <laughs> yeah. So what did you think about when you were um, casting for these... Role. I mean, you know, all of them, but I mean, I think about Merkin, I think about Tressler. I mean, what, who did well, you think about? I mean, I think that to speak of a quality that I think is required of everybody in the play, I mean, they, uh, you know, I hope Ayad won't uh, be troubled by, by making this comparison, but the play has Shakespearean demands. It's a, it's a language play. It requires a kind of, uh, you know, warm hearts and cool heads and uh, a mastery of, uh, of, this, of this language and a willingness to actually take a, a dive, perhaps not as deep as Ayad's, but deep into what is really uh, being discussed. But everybody in the play, and it was a, it's been a, it was a very long, very exhilarating process to uh, cast the play. I mean, all four uh, of the actors on stage tonight and every one of their colleagues in uh, the company have a, uh, access to the emotional life that surrounds uh, money, the, the uh, cues for revenge or status or the settling of scores or um, or love I mean I think uh, uh, the money often substitutes or is a vehicle for the expression of love and it is in fact in this play that's uh, seen but there's they also have to talk very quickly in this play and use financial words in ways that are concrete and about something human in the moment and not hide behind the abstraction of those words. And that's a, that's a skill. They know. have to be, you know, I'd say kind of interested in the combat of the play. It is not a naturalistic play. There's, they're, they're not sort of places to lounge or rummage in desks or uh, it's, it's these warriors of finance out there on usually a very open, empty stage, and that is, that is one of the most thrilling things to see, I think, if it, if it goes well. Uh, and I think we have uh, the people to make sure it goes very well. Did you have a system for sort of testing out how translatable some of these more complex financial ideas were to audiences who may not have been, you know, who might not be steeped in that mm -hmm. terminology and in that world? I mean, yeah, I think we did, we, I mean, the, the development process entailed a lot of readings and a lot of exposure to the audience before we did uh, uh, full production at La Jolla, and uh, Doug and I were there every night at previews, and, uh, you know, well, you can learn a lot from sitting with an audience watching your work, because you can kind of sense when the audience is checking out or doesn't understand, and people will come and ask you questions afterwards, and they're like, I didn't get that part, and then you kind of figure out, oh, they didn't understand this thing or that thing. I think we have more of that work ahead uh, in previews, um, but uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been a long process of ironing out the the uh, the creases where people's you know attentions might get lost because of their worry that they don't understand something. And I think the climate in the room uh, is very ruthless about making things as clear as possible. 
uh, to somebody who is not steeped in it. And that uh, climate is really set by Ayad, who I must say is, I've worked with a lot of playwrights. I've worked with people who've uh, won the Pulitzer Prize. I've never met uh, or worked with an author who is as ruthless with himself about uh, clarifying, paring down, finishing a brilliant speech and losing it when it does not seem to fit in the box of his play. Um, I've, I've never had to do a lot, much dissuading. On the contrary, sometimes you're like, stop cutting, don't cut that. <laughs> That's right. Hold on, let's wait. That's right. Was there, a, was there a particular thing that you guys... Yes, there was a scene. I wish <laughs> we, I just yeah. wish. No, we didn't disagree, but I, okay. I still wish we could yeah. have found it in the... There's a scene where Pronsky is chewing out his accountant because his accountant is dealing with an audit. And throughout the play, there's this thing where Pronsky, who is loosely inspired by Bosky, Ivan Bosky, has been trading on information, and he has to split the take 50-50 with Robert Merkin. And so Merkin keeps asking him for this check for six and a half million throughout the first act. Like, where is the check you owe me? And at the end of the first act, Pronsky finally gives him the check. And then in the second act, Pronsky's accountant is in an audit, and the auditor the, from Pricewaterhouse is asking for some receipts for $10,000 that, Pronsky, that Pronsky's accountant has lost. And so the accountant says, why are you writing me for 10000 when I have six million undocumented over here? <laughs> This is, based, this is loosely based on a true story, actually. And, and so that becomes the linchpin that eventually brings Merkin down because they have that check and Merkin's signature's on the back and there's no documentation for it. And, but there was a scene where Pronsky discovers with his accountant that his accountant has done this and chews him out. And I think it was the funniest scene in the play. But it wasn't serving. Uh, but so what happened? Doug, or no, he thinks there's still funny scenes in the play. Sorry. I, I, I do think there are funny scenes in the play. I also think that, um, yes, it was Ayad, and you will come to agree with me, yeah, was... an entirely dispensable scene. <laughs> uh, it was. It was local, it was local color, yeah. and it was taking uh -huh. up too much yeah. space. And, you know, we want to know what's yeah. happening in the story. We don't need this little... So now it's just part of a little speech that... You know, Pronsky gets on the phone. Oh, Bob, my fucking It's there. Account. I mean, I think it's there. You know, I mean, there were at one point three other characters in the play. And you do realize that, I mean, we're fortunate that we have at Lincoln Center a, a producer who's ready to say, this is a strong new American play. I believe in it. And if it takes 23 people to play it, I'm going to put it out on that stage. And I really do feel like saying that Lincoln Center, could we couldn't, have landed in a, in a more congenial uh, theater. But um, you do, you know, uh, reduction releases power. And I think we've spent time trying to <laughs> herd. I've right? heard that before. Yes. <laughs> editors. From your editors, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Kill your darlings, all that. Right. Yes. I, th I think you would have possibly had to, had to add a whole section at an offshore tax haven in Bermuda if you had kept yeah. The screaming at the accountant. <laughs> Maybe. Because yeah. that's where all that money in the real story right. went to right. hide as right. in the right. Cayman Islands. So Leo Tressler on one side and Robert Merkin and his, uh, you know, uh, the guy he picks to, to lead the charge, Israel Peterman on the other side, and that's the battle that plays out. Uh, those are the two parties that are trying to buy Everson Steel over the course of uh, the play, and one party wins and the other party doesn't. So but I won't tell you who. <laughs> So um, it, it seems it seems that um, Everson has this brutal decision. You know, he's got these really two un, unpalatable choices. One is this horrible leverage buyout where he loses control of the whole thing. The other option is seeing his company broken up into little pieces, and somehow that's going to finance this friendlier takeover. So how do you see the translation of that into you know into the real world? I mean, I think that Tom Everson. You know, I think maybe it's giving something away to say that Tom Everson is a, is a man who is perhaps not equipped with sufficient, uh, you know, he's, he's not heartless enough for the new landscape. And to make a decision based on anything other than the numbers means that he is at a disadvantage, always. 
Um, and so he's trying to keep steel alive because keeping that, those mills open keeps the town employed. That town is the town that he grew up in, that his family is from. They were the richest family in the town. The town depended on them. His father's charge to him was always, you have to take care of these people. You know, it is a vision of American business that some people share. You know, a, famously, this book recently came out by Beth Macy called Factory Man. Um, you know, the furniture industry completely decimated by China. Uh, you know, you can, as a furniture company, you can, uh, you can have your wood cut in China, or you can actually have it cut in North Carolina, which is where most furniture business used to happen. It was Michigan and North Carolina. You can have your, your wood cut in North Carolina. You can have it shipped in containers to China, made on spec in China in factories, shipped back to North Carolina, where it can be, you can put a label on it, says that it's your brand, and sell it and make more money because the margins are better than actually doing all of that in North Carolina, right? So. This guy, I uh, can't remember his name, but Factory Man in, in, uh, in, the, in Beth Macy's book tries to figure out a model where they can do it all in North Carolina to, because keeping jobs in that community is something that mattered to him because it was part of his family for many generations. But how many people are really, you know, Daniel Loeb is certainly not making a decision, you know, based on those, those factors. So it's just, it, times have changed. So I think the play is trying to dramatize that shift where there were other competing values, even in American business, that did not have to do solely with the bottom line. I mean, listening to the scene, I, I really heard uh, tonight uh, the fact that um, the Tom apologizes to Max for his idealism. That that uh, that those the 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 terms in which he approaches his business, he begins to feel, uh, he feels he needs to apologize to Max that they're, they're a sign of uh, weakness, of soft thinking. And, um, and I, th I certainly have found uh, in uh, uh, my comings and goings in the society that there's a great deal of that kind of Spartan approach to how we talk about business, how we talk about each other, do the numbers uh, work, and that I think we've drifted uh, a great, a, a far distance from uh, the dreaming of a society where uh, basic social needs are are met, and a bit closer to one in which um, uh, ac individual acquisition is glorified. Well, and there's been a real shortening of the time horizon for right. investors, and and therefore companies who have investors to answer to. So, of course, we see here Mr. Everson has this plan to convert all the mills into some other more efficient, new te high technology sort of system, but no one has the patience to make an investment like that, and we can see that reflected everywhere from the crumbling subway to, you know, the fact that... Yeah, I mean, I think it's very observable that our, our world seems to be allergic to the idea of the future. Like, you know, we don't want to plan for it. Right. You don't want to think about it. I mean, it's in that uh, uh, first scene, you know, first quarter, second quarter, and that's about as far as our business, our, our, our consciousness reaches. So, so my editor has a, a term, uh, he calls it Trump adjacent. So whenever we're, we're coming up with stories to do, he says, well, that's Trump adjacent, by which he means it's not about Trump directly because there are too many stories all about Trump and his family and so on. But, uh, you know, we're always looking for pieces we can do that are about, that help explain why we have Trump and why he's the president. And a lot of those stories, most of them are largely economic stories. So I wanted to know if you thought that junk was somehow Trump adjacent in that way. Does it help explain? Does what's going on here and the way it plays out, uh, you know, over the last few decades, does that help explain how we got to where we are? I think that you know, Chinese have a wonderful. The Chinese have a wonderful proverb: "says in the in a house where the son kills the father, the causes do not lie between the morning and the evening of a single day." Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I so, think about that one. <laughs> so I think that what I'd say is that 
anybody who has been a close observer of the landscape, the psychic landscape uh, of this country with, with some understanding of finance has, would have seen this coming a long time ago. You know, a Walmart moves into a community and 86 cents of every dollar spent in that Walmart leaves that community. So many adjacent businesses are killed by the presence of that big box store and wealth is leaked out of the landscape. For what? To the benefit of the shareholders, most of whom are family members of the Walton family. That's shareholder rights. That's American democracy at work. There's something fundamentally, it's an aberration on some level. And I think we're seeing the blowback. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of it's an odd thing because the blowing back is actually only accelerating the same process. Because we've put into office people who made their money at this era doing exactly this. These, this is, these are the guys. Yeah, no, Merkin is running the Treasury Department yeah, right now. It's yeah. kind of amazing. Merkin, Wilbur yeah. Ross, I mean, yeah. all of them. It, these are guys who came of age in the 80s doing exactly this work. And so. if, I, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, somewhere along the line, our president said before uh, he was a candidate, uh, I love debt. I'm the king of debt. Um, and I, I, yes. It's a and bankruptcy. Yes. Yeah, and bankruptcy. Yeah. It's a passion yeah. for irreality. We have, we have become a nation passionately addicted to irreality. And I think that the advent of debt at the beginning of the 80s was the f harbinger of this passion for the unreal. So um, do you think, so, so as far as, I mean, I'm curious to know if you think that you may tackle this subject again. Both of you. Oh, well, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Well, I, I'm in the spring. I'm going to do a play uh, called Dan Cody's Yacht. Dan Cody's Yacht is something that figures in the great, great American novel, The Great Gatsby. And it's the yacht that Gatsby swam out to as a young man. Uh, it's a wonderful play by a guy named uh, Tony Giardina. But it's about aspiration and who gets to get educated in our society what how can you get how can you become a member of an elite how can you get there whether it's the conference of an ivy league degree or whatever and it's it it does have to do with uh, uh, on a on a much smaller scale on a kind of living room scale this play is played out on, you know, both coasts and um, involves many sectors of uh, society. The press, in addition to uh, banking and uh, the law and uh, federal law enforcement. Uh, but uh, Dan Cody's Yacht uh, happens in, in rooms and it's about uh, the, the, school, the, the uh, tension that uh, parents and children feel about whether there will be such a thing as a future for them. So I'm just having a blast all year <laughs> long. <laughs> Do you, I had you, you have, um, you know, so much of your prior work has, has dealt very directly with spirituality. I'm curious to know if you see spirituality in the financial world at all. Trying not to laugh at my question, but it's no, just no. I think it's, an, I think it's an other. important question. I mean, I think we, as somebody who's interested in, for lack of a better word, uh, you know, why we're here and uh, what the truth of that may be, um, it's really very perplexing to understand to see how the world is constructed. It doesn't seem to make any sense. Um, it seems that uh, you know. Difficulty and uh, suffering and a great deal of dysfunction and mediocrity and evil really are in a s are always seem always to be in ascendancy somehow, and so any somebody who's trying to figure out what in God's name is going on here, I think uh, naturally gravitates to a study of the world or in some some cases a retreat from the world, but my reaction's been the opposite. I want to know what is going on. I want to understand it. What is, what is this? What is it? What's going on? So I think that's the, 
you know, I think, you know, the, the Sufis and the Kabbalists have this idea that if you can hold two opposing ideas, well, Fitzgerald actually has this. He says, the test of a fine mind is to be able to hold two opposing thoughts at the same time and still be able to retain the ability to function, right? And I think that's a great dramaturgical principle, that if you can hold opposing points of view, I think you sometimes say about this play that the last person who spoke... Yeah, the plays I like the best are the ones in which you agree with whoever has spoken last. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that's a thing to aspire to. And if you can create a space where the audience legitimately can continue to agree with the last person who spoke, that kind of sort of expansive way of seeing and feeling, I think, can have an effect when you walk out. So.